think we've got over 300 employees. We've got, I think, 60, 70 million users. Uh, I don't check the count every day. Everything is great. Big product. Everything is rising. What What is the reason to quit such a big thing and start something else? 99.9% .9 of what makes a company successful is the execution and the operations and uh, the team. What people do next after they, they build a million business? Hello guys, uh, thank you that you are listening to us today. And today in our studio, we have the great guest, uh, the good friend of mine and the partner with whom we worked uh, lots, of, uh, lots of time. And uh, the serial digital entrepreneur, Jay Severson. And this is, uh, I, know of, uh, I know about Jay as the entrepreneur who built a lot of uh, games and digital products. Uh, one of his biggest one, from what I know is the chess.com, but I believe Jay can talk more a, a lot about himself. Yeah. Great. Okay, please go ahead. Tell, sure, tell, sure. tell who you are. <laughs> All right. We'll do. Thanks, Andre. It's, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah. So my background uh, basically is a computer science major. I studied programming in high school. I studied programming in college. And uh, I was working as a software engineer for several years before a buddy of mine from college decided to uh, start chess.com. And so he asked me if I wanted to, to do it with him. And uh, I was reluctant at first because there's not a lot of money to be made. It's a small niche market. Um, I love chess. I was chess club president in college. I played it in high school. So I've always been a huge fan of the game, uh, but I had seen a lot of businesses fail in the space. I know it's a very tough space to make money in. People don't like to pl uh, pay money to play chess. Uh, but he convinced me that if we did it properly and we had a great domain, uh, we could capitalize on a lot of uh, missing facets uh, of online chess. And so we started kind of small. We didn't raise a lot of money. We didn't raise any money. Uh, we borrowed some money. Uh, we bootstrapped it. Uh, we moonlighted while we had other jobs. Um, I had a lot of contract work. I had a day job. And I just kind of worked on it when I could. And uh, it took us a couple years to kind of launch like our first real version and get members coming in um and it's grown today to be you know the number one chess site in the world with uh, i think we've got over 300 employees we've got i think 60 70 million users uh i don't check the count every day but it goes up every day um and uh it's yeah it's great we've got like i think uh almost close to 10 million monthly active users now and there's millions of games played every day. Uh, it's a fantastic company. It's a fantastic team. I was proud to be a part of it for from 2006 to 2017 or 18, I think is when I finally left as the full-time CTO there. Um, and I'm off doing other things. Okay, so uh, did, did I understand right? So from 2006 till 2016, you was the 17, you was the CTO of the chess.com. Can you tell us a little bit more about this experience? Like what it is, to be the CTO of the team where you have millions of users. And, uh, you know, I, I have account there too, guys. So, I mean, the, this is cool project. Uh, this is really also awesome experience. You can learn there. So go there and, and do, do it now. Create your account now, like, you know, when, after you listen to this. <laughs> but yeah, Jay, yeah. question to you. Like, what is like to be the CTO of such a big product? I mean, do you need to be yourself the software developer who know any tiny step that happened in all or, or no like how how it looked like in the very beginning it's very different right so being the cto of a 300 person company is very different than being a co-founder and a team of two uh so when we, when we first started it we were just working in my bedroom uh my my partner eric all would come over and we would work out of my house in san jose um and, and that was the office and um you know it was just me and him in a room and we would just whiteboard and he would say like this is what we should build and we would have conversations about it and then we would kind of set up like a, a product pipeline and uh there was nobody to assign the work to it was just me so i would just sit and code all night long um and it was a lot of very long hours in the beginning where it was just me trying to trying to get stuff done uh, initially we had a very very small product scope of like we just wanted to have like an email um, solution so people could come to the chess site and, and get an at chess.com email address, which back in the day, everybody wanted like a cool, you know, uh, flavorful email address. And so we thought, oh, any chess people will love to have an at chess.com email address. And so that was one thing we wanted to build. We wanted a directory listing of other chess sites, uh, like a forums and all that. Uh, and we wanted some basic like uh, articles about learning and how to play chess. Uh, so it was very just kind of content oriented. Uh, we didn't even want to build a, a, a 
we didn't want to build a feature where people could actually play chess because there was already a lot of places where you could play chess online. So that wasn't even one of our initial goals. Um, and so we kind of launched those things and we had blogs initially in the early days. Uh, a lot of people came and they would write blogs and provide content. And lucky for us, because user created content was an early piece of our business model, we SEO'd very, very well. So we captured a long, a lot of long tail uh, SEO search. Um, you know, things like, you know, who are the top 10 best chess players of all time? You know, we might have an article about that or, uh, you know, Bobby Fischer's greatest games or whatever. And so uh, we had a lot of users contributing a lot of great content. And so our site grew very quickly on the content side, which allowed us to SEO very well, especially with the domain name. Um, and so traffic grew fairly quickly in those first couple of years. But as as the CTO at the time, my main job was just writing code. I mean, I would I, I, I had to architect the MySQL database. I had to you know build the APIs. Uh, the very first framework we used back then was called Qcodo. It was a PHP LAMP based framework. In the early days, we were a, a LAMP stack. Um, so that's you know Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. That, that was kind of the framework that we used. And there was no predominant PHP framework. And so I had chose one called uh, Qcodo, uh, which allowed me to kind of do all of the front end and back end as a single developer. It was a great framework for a very small team. And that kind of carried us through the early years. Um, we hired, you know, like our first developer who was going to out of Poland, who was going to help us build our, our live chess feature uh, online. Um, Piotr uh, Dashtera uh, was our first live chess developer. And then, um, you know, the team grew very, very slowly in the beginning because we didn't have any funds. Um, and so for the first, I would say, five years, I was just coding. I was coding and then maybe assigning tickets out at a very slow pace to two or three developers who joined us in the early days. Um, and then once the team grew to a certain size and the company really started to snowball, I found myself mainly focused on database growing pains. Um, MySQL was a big struggle for us. Um, it's very difficult to use at times when you're when your site is growing that fast and you have to have all the right indexes and you know all this kind of like tech stuff that we ran into. I was up all night long. I was up 24 hours a day at times trying to make sure that our MySQL database wasn't crashing all the time. So at the time I hated it. It was it was painful. It was I was not making a lot of money. It was consuming all of my time. And having a fast growing site is what you always want, but uh, be careful what you wish for because it's extremely stressful and extremely tiring to support a site that's growing that quickly. Uh, especially when you have a very small team and very little funds, you're kind of the, the last line of defense. So every single time there was a page that was not working or there was a database problem or there was a table you know, that was, that was an issue in, in MySQL, I had to just work all night long to get it fixed because there was users clamoring to use the site and the site would be down. And there's nobody to call, uh, and so that 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 situation was extremely difficult to be in. Um, we hired a lot of consultants back then uh, to try to help us with our growing pains. Uh, we use a lot of Te technical consultants are more like business ones. No, 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 all all technical consultants. So they were MySQL experts, uh, people that were that had experience with very large data sets, um, and uh, they would kind of come in and try to help us optimize our database or give us actual. Uh, software updates to MySQL that would be more performant. Um, so that was what life was like very early on as a CTO. It was just scrambling all the time. It was making sure the site was still up and running. It was writing lots of code. It was adding new features. Um, and then after a few years, we turned on our subscriptions and money started coming in the door. We were able to start hiring people. We were profitable. Um, it was nice. We could finally take a small salary for ourselves as the founders. And um, I, people had always said, like, never stop coding, because once you stop coding, you'll never go back. And so I was like, well, I'm always going to code. That's just who I am. But the, the team grew so quickly, at some point, you just run out of time, and you find yourself all day long just doing pull request reviews or, you know, onboarding new people or, you know, architecting or whatever. And, and before you know it, after a while, I was writing very, very little code and just managing the team most of the time and having high-level product meetings with our product people or with, you know, Eric, uh, the CEO, um, and so I just found myself not writing code anymore and, uh, it didn't, wasn't like a conscious decision that I made. It just happened slowly over time. Do you and miss, do, like, do you regret this decision and you miss the time when you're writing the code or, or no? Or for you sure. understand that this is, ah, you, you do. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you have different stages in your life and you'll go through the same thing now that you have a kid, but like, you know, back then I had a lot of time. I was a college student and then, um, you know, even after college, I didn't have kids yet. And so you just have a lot more time on your hands. And so it's a little bit easier when you're younger and you're more energetic. 
um, and you're not as tired that, you know, you can work long hours and you can work till four in the morning and you can still survive the next day. Uh, cause you don't have to get up and take kids to school and pick kids up from school and all this kind of stuff. But, um, as I've become more of like a dad and a family, family guy, there's just no way that I'd be able to, to live that lifestyle anymore. And coding requires a certain level of focus and not being inter interrupted and, um, it's just I don't have the lifestyle to, to really do that. So as much as I miss it, um, realistically, it's it makes a lot more sense for me these days to go out and find other people who are at that stage in their career where they both love it, they have the passion for it, they have the time for it. Uh, so yes, I miss it. I miss coding a lot. It's probably the thing I miss the most from my career is just writing code and solving problems and figuring out cool patterns. And uh, I really like that, um, but uh, I just don't have the time for it. And uh, there's people out there who are better than I am. And the technology changes so fast and evolves so fast that, you know, unless you're constantly keeping yourself up to date, you know, you become a dinosaur pretty quickly in this field. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So that, just to make, you know, just to resume and to understand the timeline. So the chess.com started somewhere in 2006 and like first, first, I believe like four or five years, you was like the only, almost only developer who doing it uh, as your only job, right? So is like, was there at the, the part where you have some kind of the day job and then chess.com or in some point you just, you just work on that chess.com, right? Yeah. So we launched the site in 2006. I think that the first lines of code uh, were probably being written in 2004, I want to say. Um, I'd have to go back and check my exact emails, but I, it, the code was actually being written quite a bit earlier. Uh, I had I had a full-time job. Um, I worked for a real estate, <clears throat> um, an online real estate mortgage brokerage company that was working on online solutions for that whole industry. Um, and I, I worked there as my day job. And then in the evenings I would come home and I would work on chess.com code. Uh, whenever I could find the time. I was also a contractor consultant for a lot of other companies doing side work as a developer as well. So I had to, I was wearing quite a few different hats at the time. Um, I worked for 2K Sports, the video game company, and I would run tournaments for them. Um, I also was consulting and building um, e-commerce websites for a couple different companies at the time. So I was definitely spread thin, but I worked a lot of hours, but I loved to code. And um, and then I think we launched chess.com in 2006. I, at that point, I had left my day job and was pretty fully committed to chess.com, but still had a lot of contract work to pay the bills. And then as chess.com started to grow, I think by 2008 or so, or 2009, I had left most of my contract work behind. As much as I love being a contractor and doing that stuff, I mean, you, your hourly rate is can be really, really good and the cash is fantastic. You don't have any skin in the game for the most part. So you, you work on projects, you launch projects, and then you're no longer part of the project. And so, you know, I wanted to work on something that was more of my own, that I could own long term, that was my baby. Um, and so uh, I kind of got burnt out of doing contract work after a while. And so chess.com was a great opportunity to actually build something that was going to be, you know, ours forever and that we could really put our passion behind because I was very much a chess player and chess enthusiast. Uh, but I think Eric and I both, the great thing about us is that we were business minded first and chess players second. And I think a lot, a lot of the reasons why people failed in the space was because they were chess players first and business second. And so they were so enamored by anything they could possibly do in the chess space. They weren't really, um, they weren't careful enough on the business side of things to make sure that they didn't overspend um or didn't over promise or you know over architect or whatever and so a lot of companies like uh, a famous one was kasparovchess.com they were like the late 90s uh, a big online chess site that had raised millions of dollars and had a big development team um you know they just they raised too much money and spent too much money building the product and there wasn't enough revenue coming in and so you know they went bankrupt and I think because we started so small and didn't raise money and we were a two man team and we didn't hire until we actually had revenue coming in the doors, we were all just, we were very nimble and very thoughtful about how we grew the, how we grew the company. We never like outspent, you know, what we had. Um, and so I think that's, that was a big reason for our success is we just, we, we grew at a nice steady pace. Okay, so um, you told that you left chess.com in 2017, like, is there a, like any, like, why? I mean, everything is great, big product, everything is rising. What What is the reason to quit such a big thing and start something else? Well, at the t I mean, there was there was numerous times. So in 2000, um, 
2011, my partner and I, and then another partner had come in and we had started exercise.com. And so I think from the very, very beginning, my, my partner and I thought that this would be a nice lifestyle business, that it would be something that could generate some passive revenue on the side, uh, but it would never maybe be our full-time jobs. Like we would build up the, the, the site, we could push it out there, people would use it and it would be what it is. We wouldn't spend a lot of time adding new features because once you can play chess, once you can kind of like st study chess and share your games, like we're, we're done. Like, you know, the sites, that's all we ever really wanted to build was a place to play or a place to share. Reality, you need to give new features. Right, right. right. Always. But so <laughs> at some point in like 2010, 2011, we thought, well, chess is a great business. It's never going to be a really big business because it's a very small niche market and what if we took our same uh business model and applied it to a much bigger industry you know get a great domain name build a great uh content-based product uh we can charge more money there'll be more users because everybody exercises or wants to exercises or needs to exercise or whatever and so we came upon an opportunity to where we could get that domain name um and we wanted to get in the exercise space and so for two years, we were kind of distracted working on exercise.com while chess on the side continued to snowball and grow. Um, and uh, we were kind of had our, you know, one foot in each company as we tried to manage both. And after a couple of years, we realized like, wow, exercise.com is going to be really, really difficult um, to make it work because it's such a competitive space. Uh, people actually hate to exercise as much as they need to. So getting them to come back and use the product is actually very difficult. Whereas with chess, people just love to play it. You don't have to like lure them back in. People just like to play the game. Um, it was just a very, very different experience. And we had also raised a couple million dollars from investors. Uh, so there was, it was a very stressful environment where we had this ticking time bomb sensation of like we're running out of money all the time and we need to make sure that we make money before we run out of money. Um, and so around 2013, we kind of looked and we were like, oh, wow, well, chess.com is, is still growing. It's getting bigger than we thought it was ever going to be. It needs more attention. It needs more product. We need massive like UI updates. Uh, it needs to be mobile friendly. We need apps, you know, like all this stuff was happening in, 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 the, in the online space that we need to keep up in order to be relevant. And so Eric and I both stepped away from exercise.com to focus our full attention on chess.com once again. Um, but I think after a certain number of years, like for me, I really enjoyed the startup environment. I loved it when we were kind of like 30 to 50 people and we were all grinding and we wore a lot of different hats. And at some point, you know, we're no longer like a startup. Like it felt like it was starting to become like a medium sized company. And um, I mean, it's still a small business given, you know, a few hundred employees, but it, it felt very different culturally than it did when we were a really small company. And Eric and I were always friends before we were business partners. And, you know, it's like having a roommate, you know, you get, or like being married in some sense, but right. It's like, we were very good friends, but you're obviously going to have differences over the years. And he's pushing hard on product and he wants a certain thing on the product side for the users. And I'm always pushing on the tech side to make sure that we don't over-engineer or that the site can sustain whatever product is we're trying to build. So we clashed all the time. I mean, it was, it was healthy clashes and healthy arguments. But we, we, we did. We had a lot of clashes. And I think after over 10 years of working together, I think it was clear for both of us that in order to like save our friendship, we probably should go our separate ways. And there was a lot of very, very good engineers within the company at that point that I felt fully uh, confident in that they could take the reins and, and run with the company on the tech side. And um, there was the crypto, crypt, cryptocurrency had come along. I was very much into cryptocurrency. Um, there was a few startup ideas that I had in the cryptocurrency space that I wanted to explore as well. And I didn't have the time for it as long as I was at chess.com. Um, so I just kind of wanted to go off and, and try new things. And, um, it was clear that just like we had kind of like, we had pushed our friendship and our partnership as long as we possibly could. And one of them had to give. And so I'm, I'm happy to say that Eric and I are still very good friends. And I think a lot of that is because we parted at the right time where it was like, let's, let's stay friends. You continue to run the business. I'm going to go off and do other things. And, um, and that's, that's, that's kind of why I left. Okay. That's, that's super interesting. So, okay. And, and what next? Like you, you understand that you can't, like you having lots of free time. Um, what next? Like w w what people do next after they, they build a million business, million dollar business. <laughs> So I've dabbled in a lot of different things, and I, I like to refer to most of them as hobby projects. Um, and I think the reason why I refer to them as hobby projects is because as long as I'm funding it and I haven't gone out and taken other people's money, 
I have the leisure of working on them as long as I want for, or as little as I want, or, you know, end of lifing them when I want. Um, but most of them for me are just kind of passion projects. It's like, it would be cool if I had an app that did this, or it would be cool if there was a cryptocurrency site that allowed you to do that. So, um, it is true what they say in the startup space that like for every one success, you probably have nine failures. And I think I've checked off all the boxes of those nine failures, right? So, you know, exercise.com didn't go great, but it was a great experience. And I learned a ton about, you know, raising a lot of money and trying to build like a, a, a real Silicon Valley startup. And, you know, we had offices and all that. So it, it was a good experience in the sense that I know that I never really want to do that again. Like it was too much of a pressure cooker environment for me. I don't like having to like re report to investors all the time about like, this is where we're at. We're going to make money soon, whatever, whatever. That was just was very, very different culturally than, than the chess.com experience. Um, in the crypto space, I invested in Bitcoin when it was right around $100. So that kind of tells you when I first got into it. And uh, I thought cryptocurrency was going to really, really revolutionize, you know, the financial world, uh, the gold world, you know, store of value, uh, remittance, ability to send money around the world. Like there was so many cool features about Bitcoin and about cryptocurrency. When I first got introduced to it, I was like, wow, like this feels like the next Internet revolution to me. Um, and so I first I kind of invested in it. I tried a hardware startup in the cryptocurrency space where we actually built uh, mining machines. Um, I tried a online betting, uh, skill-based betting platform that was based on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies where you could bet on games of backgammon and other games of skill. Um, all of these had like limited amounts of success. Like we launched them, we had users, they were doing okay. But at some point it just became clear that like, um, it either was too painful, there may, there were legal issues involved that were going to be very expensive to figure out and overcome. I mean, the U.S. is a very, very strict country when it comes to, you know, financials, to betting, to gambling, to all this kind of stuff. And so um, I had issues with that. When it comes to skill-based betting, you also have to deal with a lot of cheating. Um, so that was a big hurdle for me to overcome. And, and like, it's not fun to be in a... In a to be running a company where the users are constantly complaining about being cheated out of their money and having to like resolve those disputes. It's just not a fun position to be in. And so, um, I didn't really it love, it feels like you have conscience, Chris, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I think there's a ton of money to be made, but it was not a fun space to be in. Um, and so I pivoted Gambit, that was Gambit.com, which I pivoted towards just a casual gaming platform, ran it for like five more years where people could just kind of play casual games. Um, was super fun to run, was super fun to build, had a, had a pretty good dev team there, went through a few dev teams. Um, and we had a pretty flow of, a pretty good flow of decent traffic. Um, but I could never really crack the SEO nut with Gambit the way we did with chess.com. And so getting new users to that platform was always difficult. And so the platform never really like took off the way that I wanted it to. It just kind of was plateauing and was flat the whole time. And as much as I wanted to keep users happy, uh, it just financially didn't make sense to continually run it year after year where I was always kind of in the red a little bit, cost money to run the servers and to keep a developer on hand to like, you know, fix bugs and all that. So I think about six months ago, I finally decided to shut Gambit down uh, permanently. And... Um, uh, the one thing I haven't really talked about is just the fact that I'm a gamer. If you can't tell from all the stuff behind me, like I love to, I love to play games in general. I've always been a big gamer. Uh, I was a Starcraft world champion in 1998. Uh, as I said, I was very big into chess. Um, and so what's your rating on chess.com? My rating on chess.com. Oh man, right now it's pretty bad. It's like 1800 maybe. I mean, that's a, that, okay, okay. that's First about the level 1800. It's uh, I have one, one 1100, I believe right now. <laughs> and it took me, you know, a year at least. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I know people always think like, you know, you started chess.com, you should be a grandmaster. And it's like, well, I don't have the time to, to play chess when I'm, <laughs> when I'm writing code all day, but uh, oh, people also think that I code very good because I have the company that code. <laughs> right, so, right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, so I'm okay at chess. I think I'm uh, I'm better than your coffee shop player, but I'm nowhere near as good as like the professionals uh, and the you know masters, international masters. So um, I've always been big into games, and so um, I just felt that like everything that I do. I'm, I have much more passion for it if it's if it's gaming related. And so the cryptocurrencies uh, companies that I had started, some of them were not gaming related. And I, I noticed that I kind of burned out pretty early on. 
Um, so currently what, I, what, I, what I'm working on is a Landover app, which is basically a Settlers of Catan variant or style of game uh, that's playable mostly on your mobile phone. Um, the reason why I saw a need for that is, is I'm a huge Settlers of Catan fan. Um, and the current solutions that are out there, I just don't love them. And I also think that Settlers of Catan is due for some updates. So the game is easier to learn and faster to play. And so I saw what Blizzard did when they came in and created Hearthstone. Uh, it was brilliant. They took a very popular game, Magic the Gathering, a collectible card game, which, which is a very, very fun kind of poker chess mix of luck and skill. And um, they made a better game. They made it so it was easier to learn. They made it so it was a shorter time commitment. Uh, they added a bunch of cool visuals and graphics too, which doesn't doesn't hurt. Um, but uh, you know, the Magic the Gathering purists don't like Hearthstone because they changed a lot of the mechanics and, and simplified the game and the mana curve and all these other things. Um, but as somebody who knew of Magic the Gathering but never played it a lot and then tried Hearthstone, I fell in love with Hearthstone right away. I was like, this is a beautiful game. If you like poker, if you like chess, you know, it has a good mix of luck and skill. Um, and so I've played a lot of Hearthstone. And I kind of saw the same opportunity with Catan, which is I love Catan, but I don't really have time to sit down and play an hour game of Catan. But I love the basic concept of it. I love like the hexagon board. I love the resource gathering. I love trying to choose your decision tree of where you want to build and, and scale up technology or, or culture or whatever. Um, and so I kind of just sat down and I thought about all the different things that we could do at Catan to speed the game up, to make it simpler. Um, and so I came up with a bunch of ideas and I wrote those down and I started writing out my rule sheet. And I thought, I, I kind of looked at there and there's the, there was a couple offerings on the market. There's the official Catan game that's out there right now which a lot of people complain about. It's full of bugs. Uh, I think the interface is terrible. It's very clunky and hard to use. The technology is kind of old and dated. Um, and so I, you know, I, I saw that as an easy opportunity to come in and build something better. Um, and so we've got a team of like five developers or so that are working on it kind of full time with one of, you know, a couple of your designers that have been helping us along the way. Um, and I think the game looks amazing. It's beautiful. We've been play testing it now for several months. We're just kind of making sure that the um, the technology that we built it on is Flutter and Firebase. And we've been having to move a lot of our logic off of the client and into the cloud on Firebase and cloud functions to make sure that we have a single source of truth and the game is very reliable. Because the one thing I don't want is to come along and say like, oh, look at these other versions of Catan and how unreliable are and they crash and then launch our own game and it also be unreliable and crash, right? So I have to make sure that I deliver a product that is very reliable, that is solid, uh, very, you know, very thoroughly tested. Um, and so I think we thought we were gonna launch it like a year ago and it was just clear that like, we needed to re-architect some things and rethink some things. Um, I, we're much, much closer now than we were. And um, I'm very excited to kind of launch that and get that out there. But, um, you know, prior to Catan, I think what was, what was nice was before I worked on the Landover app, uh, your team and I got to work on some other mobile apps. And I learned a lot about the technologies used because I never really spent a lot of time building mobile apps. And so we built a few apps together that were also game related. Uh, I'm a big mafia fan. So we built the party mafia app. We built some other fun gaming apps and the whole uh, motivation behind those was that I realized I was going on these trips together with some of my buddies and we would, we would hang out, we would play a lot of board games together, and then we would leave and, and we wouldn't talk to each other for a year. And I was like, it would be cool if you actually had an app where you could kind of play party games with your buddies over Zoom or when you're hanging out in a car ride or on a road trip or at Disneyland. Like, there's just a lot of very fun party games, but nobody wants to carry a bunch of boxes around with them every time they go somewhere. And so for me, I was like, if I'm sitting in a bar having some drinks with some buddies, it'd be fun to take out your phone and actually play some interactive party games. And so uh, we built a series of party games. Um, they're all in the app store. One's called Party Mafia, one's called Wisecrack, another one's called Word Links uh, and Buzz Clue. And they're all just kind of made uh, to provide an opportunity for you to have fun with your friends when you go out. And um, I love them all. I still play them. I still like them. I, the issue that I've had from a business standpoint is that they're not, there's not really a single player experience. And what made Among Us so popular is that 
you could download Among Us as a as a solo player and actually have a very good user experience because it has an arcade element to it. It's fun to walk around, and regardless of whether or not you actually know the people you're playing with, it's still a pretty fun game. Um, all of my games are meant to be played with friends and family, and you kind of have to know who you're playing with. And it's just not as common of a use case where people are like, well, I'm sitting down with a bunch of my friends at a party or at you know during the holidays, let's download an app. Um, in order for an app to really snowball and kind of take off, it has to have a very good single player experience, in my opinion. Um, and that's just something that I realized, like, I'm, I don't think I ever want to build a single player experience. It was never what I what those these apps were meant for. But because of that, it also means the apps are never going to be like huge. They're never going to have massive player adoption because um, every so app they, like they, they are still work i mean well i know they're still working right mm -hmm. because like our team developed that but uh, you believe that there's the something that is uh, not enough is like single player experience right yeah i think you'd have to have a single player experience i think the other thing too is just looking at the business model and the way that i structured monetization of those apps i think was a little off to be honest with you so at chess.com from the very beginning we did a subscription model and the great thing about the subscription model, it has a good side and a bad side. The great side is that once you subscribe, you know some users will fall off the platform and not use it anymore, but they may still subscribe because someday they might come back. And so every year they subscribe and like, oh yeah, I'm still paying for the site. I'm gonna go back and use it one day. You know, it's kind of like your gym membership, right? Like you don't want your gym membership to expire because you you got in at a good rate, but you don't go to the gym every day, but you still pay because you have the intention of going to the gym someday. Um, so the subscription model can be really good for a company because you get people to pay you on a regular basis. And every year that number grows and grows and grows and grows. And if, you know, generally speaking, from the moment we've launched chess.com, our number of subscribers has always gone up. You know, we always have more this year than we did the previous year. And so as long as that's going up, your revenue is going to continue to grow. And it's very reliable. You can kind of plan and estimate how much money you're going to make. Um, the, the downside of the subscription model um, is that you kind of max out the amount of money you can make per user. So if you look at a game like Candy Crush, um, those types of games are very good about figuring out like how to create walls, paywalls within the game or ways where they say, hey, if you want to get past this, you should buy that. If you want to get past this, you should buy that. And they constantly entice users to buy small micropayments within the app. Uh, so what people call in-app purchases, right? And so most mobile apps these days use in-app purchases um, but they have a big team behind exactly how to do it in such a way that it is very addictive, has a good hook, um, and you're constantly kind of running into reasons why, oh yeah, I'll spend another $5, I'll buy some more coins so I can pass this level or so I can get this cool skin or whatever, whatever. And um, I went that route, which I think was actually the wrong route to go because people don't play the apps enough to make the in-app purchases enticing. And I don't really have a full-time team constantly adding new in-app purchases. And so let's say I've got a guy comes along, he loves Party Mafia. And I have a, I have a group of people who play Party Mafia weekly, and they're very much into it. But they've bought all the in-app purchases you know, a year ago. And they continue to play the game regularly, but I don't make any money from them. Um, you know, They paid maybe $100. They got all the stuff in the whole app. And now they can play for the rest of their life, and I make no money from them. So with a subscription model, I'd be making money from them forever. But because I did the in-app purchase model, they kind of bought everything, and now I make no money from them. Um, so I think with Landover, what I realize is that if people love the game, I want them to be subscribing to my service and to my game to continually help me support the servers and the ongoing development. And for me, I think that's just a better model. It's like as long as you're playing the game and you're loving the game, you could subscribe for a couple bucks a month or you know, $20, $30 a year. And I'll continue to provide you with a great gaming experience with no ads and, you know, kind of cool premium features. And that's kind of what we did at chess.com is a very similar model, which is as long as you're subscribing, we'll give you access to everything and we'll, we won't show you ads. Um, so I think <laughs> I think restructuring uh, those party gaming apps to be more of a subscription model rather than a one time purchase would have been a much better business model. So in my mind, I've always thought about going back and possibly restructuring those. But then once you do that, you're going to upset a bunch of people who bought all the in-app purchases and are like, hey, I gave you $100 and now you're asking me to subscribe, you know, so. Well, you may you may make some kind of the, you know, some su super exciting subscription for them, only for them. You know? Right, that, right. That makes sense. Right. And by the way, guys, like I believe one, uh, 
one, two or three records ago, we, we got the video here and the record here where we explaining how free apps making the money and there are lots of different types of opportunities how to get money. Uh, not only the subscription, only the purchase that I just mentioned, but this is the real great example how it's actually working in the real life. So thank you for sharing this experience. Okay, uh, I believe the last last big question, three main things that you would uh, that you would advise to the entrepreneurs who start in digital things or maybe somewhere in the middle of the you know the digital product development like what would you advise them the number one thing for me always when anybody's ever talking to me about oh i've got this idea i've got this idea because i hear that a lot i've got this idea um is that ideas are very cheap and it's all about execution and if you have an idea i guarantee you there's at least another person, if not hundreds of people around the world who have the same idea. Um, and it's not the idea um, that's going to set you apart from success. It's all about the execution and the team. And so this is why I like NDAs and all this stuff about privacy and I'll make sure you sign this before you talk to me about your idea. Like it's all kind of lame. Funny thing we have in the record where I tell him the same thing. Like when people come to me and like, I will tell you everything, but firstly sign in DM. Like, oh, okay, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, please go ahead. It's not a big deal. The idea is not the big deal. It's it, the hard part, the 99.9% .9 of what makes a company successful is the execution and the operations and um, the team. And so uh, I would say, make sure when you're going into a startup that you have a good team in place and that you know how to execute on the idea uh, and that you have a really good plan in place that you have looked at the competitors in the space i think too often people get an idea and they would just it's like oh my god i got to start on this right away you know and, and they, they they run before they're really ready to run and i do the same thing like you need to stop take a breath really spend some time brainstorming writing down the reasons why your business is going to fail right like be honest and truthful with yourself and try to talk yourself out of it and come up with all the things that could possibly go wrong. Look at all the competitors, look at people who have tried the space and have failed um, <clears throat> because it's much cheaper for you to figure that out early on than to spend months and money running and running and, and building and hiring developers or doing whatever it is you're doing and then realize like, man, I wasn't really, I wasn't diligent enough before I started all this. And if I had just spent this time reading and researching and talking to people, we could have avoided this, we could have avoided that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, really spend your time, I think, on, on preparing before you start running with your concept. That's kind of number one. Uh, number two, I would say, is making sure that you scratch your own itch. Um, so if you don't know what that term means, it's, it's when you're building a product, make it, make sure that it's something that you actually, you if, actually if you don't know use. the term and just don't start with no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I think the other thing is say, uh, you know, eat your own dog food or, or whatever. There's a bunch of different ways of Do saying it, but <laughs> yeah. So, um, this is true for me. Like every project I work on, it's almost always something that it's like, I wish this thing existed. Uh, if it did, I would use it because that makes it very, very easy to scope out, to spec, uh, because you're a potential user. Um, if you're building something that you would never use, then you've got to go out and find people who would use it and talk to those to try to do your market research to figure out what they want. Uh, it's a much, much harder process to go through and your chance of failure is much higher. Um, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the greatest products that we use today have come out of a situation where a company was building product X, but in the process realized they needed product Y, and then product Y became, became their, main, their main product, you know? Um, so just make sure that whatever it is you're building is something that you personally need and you personally would use. It makes it a lot easier to, to build it the correct way. And then once it's done, you've got your first user already. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you don't have to go out and sell it. You don't have to go out and find people to use it. Um, and let's see, number three for an entrepreneur. I don't know. I, I mean, there's there's a few things. A lot of times I'll hear people say, like, I just want to start my own company so I can be my own boss or I can work from home and set my own schedule, you know, like those kinds of things. And uh, I, I, you know, I think you're kidding yourself if you think that the startup world or being an entrepreneur is going to be easier than having a normal job where you have a boss. 
Um, I am jealous of the people that go to work from nine to five and come home and get to do whatever they want and forget about their I day so job. I so much understand and... you. I mean, I so much understand <laughs> you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, you know, like I said, the first few years of Chess.com, I I felt like I was working twenty hour days. I mean, I just some there were some days I couldn't sleep at all, and uh, you know, my wife remembers those days. And, you know, sometimes I would just go out in the garage and literally scream, like, just to, like, let out how angry I was because it was, it was exhausting and uh, it was really, really hard. And as much as I thought it was going to be so cool to be my own boss and to be a founder and to work from home and, you know, be able to golf when I want, do what I want, like, none of that's true. Like, you are always busy. There is always a ton of stress. Uh, you're, you don't have a steady paycheck, you don't have the benefits, you know? So there's a lot of difficult things about being an entrepreneur. Um, that's why, you know, entrepreneurs make the most money at the end of the day. Like if you start a successful company and that company grows in its success, you make a ton of money and everybody looks back and is like, oh, you're so lucky. Well, it's like, well, they forget about the early years when it was very, very difficult and you were doing it, uh, for no pay and no money and working long hours, um, you know, so you really do have to sacrifice and realize that most successful startups take seven to nine years before they're actually kind of quote unquote a success and that 90% of them fail. Um, so it's okay to fail. <clears throat> you got to love what you do because if you don't love it, you're going to fail and hate it. Um, so, you know, do something that you love. And so at least if it does fail, it's like, well, I loved what we did. I love the product that we built. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult road and it's not easy. And there's many times where I'm like, man, I wish I could just go back and get a regular job, like just work for a company where somebody tells me what to do and I could take a lunch break. I can go home at five o'clock and just completely forget about work. Yeah. So by the way, kudos to your wife, because I know that you are still together. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. And now okay, she's running uh, her own business, right? So now she's, uh, a, she's so an she, entrepreneur. She also understand that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Okay, I got it. Well, okay, so uh, last very briefly, short questions with super speed, speedy answers. So Apple or Microsoft? <laughs> very difficult questions. I'm, I'm going to actually say I use a PC because I'm a gamer, but I use Apple for all work-related stuff. So for my development, I have a Mac, and for gaming, I have a PC. Okay, good. Uh, like sustainable business or startup? Startup. Okay. Uh, investing, like searching money from investors or bootstrapping? Bootstrap. Uh, Star Trek or Star Wars? <laughs> Star, Star Wars. That's, okay. That's a hard, that's, that's a, that's, question, that's, that's a hard one. <laughs> I do like Star Trek a lot too, but I don't know. Star Wars at the beginning, amazing. The later Star Wars, terrible. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I also agree because I'm also the fan, you know? Yeah. Good. Uh, good guys. So, well, uh, this was super inspirational. Thank you, Jay. Even like, even for me, you know, I run the company for the eight years already and I'm listening to and I'm like, you know, like the small tier is somewhere here, you know, <laughs> so honestly, I, I totally agree with all of you kind guys. Uh, well, there is no applause, but I will do it. Uh, thank, thank you. Jay. Thanks thank for you having for your me. Time. Uh, yes, that, that was amazing. And guys, I hope you you enjoyed it. I, I know that you enjoyed it because that was super excited to hear all of this. Just a little pitch from my side. If you guys do want, if you are a Catan fan or if you never played Catan, I would love for you to go join my Discord channel. We have a Discord channel for anybody who wants to get more information about Landover and when we're launching it. We do put out little beta releases of it from time to time if you want to beta test it. Um, but yes, please check out Landover. It's not in the app stores yet. We'll be soon, but you can uh, find me on Discord. And so maybe we can post yeah, a link and to we that. Will leave, we for sure will leave the link to the Discord in the description to this, uh, to this record. Great. Yeah. Thank you all guys. Bye. Bye.